Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to this live program at All Three Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Christian Schaub from Germany. After his medical school in Freiburg, Germany, Dr. Schaub completed his orthopedic surgery residency at the University of Freiburg in Germany. Subsequently, he completed an elbow fellowship under the German Society of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery. Dr. Schaub is a member of the German and European Society for Shoulder and Elbow and also the committee member for the rehabilitation section. He's board certified under the German Children and Elbow Society and is instructor for the AGA, which is a society for arthroscopy and joint surgery in Germany. He specializes in shoulder and elbow surgery since 2012 and currently serves as the head of the German Children and Elbow Clinic. Dr. Shaw has several peer-reviewed articles on shoulder arthroplasty, more than 10 book chapters on elbow surgery, and more than 20 peer-reviewed articles on elbow surgery and he has delivered more than 150 talks about shoulder and elbow surgery all over the world. So today is my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Christian Schaub from Germany. Over to you, Christian. Okay. Sorry. Should not. Dear Professor Kapalan, Thank you very much for the friendly introduction and the invitation and opportunity to have a talk about stemless arthroplasty of the shoulder. So let me introduce myself. I'm a consultant working in the St. Vincent's Clinic Fronten. Um, I'm only doing shoulder and elbow services. Um, Fronten is near the Austrian border in the south of Munich. You maybe don't know Fronten, but you for sure know Castle Neuschwanstein, uh, which is just around the corner, 10, 10 miles away. So that's where we are. So now after getting clear where I am, maybe you should know who I am. I'm talking about shoulder arthroplasty, I think, because I'm performing around uh, 150 total shoulders per year out of which I do 70%, round about 70% uh, reverse prosthesis and 30% anatomic prosthesis, all in total shoulder arthroplasty technique. I do literally all anatomic primary implants stemless since 2013. I did about 200 stemless reverse shoulders since I started with stemless reverse implants in 2050. And the numbers are still growing because I can't see uh, many contraindications for a primary reverse if the patient is healthy and the bone is good. Um, that's why I'm talking about stemless options. And so as you will recognize in the following, I just want to share my personal thoughts about stemless and the actual literature on it. And at the end, I hope I can uh, share a little bit of my own data to provide you a kind of idea why it could be stemless in the next years. So after this short information, let's go into media's race. So let us start with the beginnings. This is in history, the first uh, shoulder implant or an artificial shoulder implanted into a man. This was Jules Pion in 1893, uh, implanting this uh, prosthesis fully out of platinum, quite expensive uh, single use implant. Uh, with a very good short-term follow-up for this time, so the patient survived. The procedure at last for two years, and then it was revised due, due to a septic shock. So for 89.3, that was quite a winner. After the very expensive implant made out of platinum um, in the 1950, the first uh, implant was tried to be made out of plastic, namely its acrylic implants. Um, they had a bad fixation and high debris and a component breakage number. In even 11 patients, they stopped the prosthesis for the market, so it was just the wrong way. Also in the 1950s, quite near to the later following knee prosthesis, Dr. Frederick Krieger implanted this into a merchant marine sailor because of uh, humor head necrosis. This was a single mended uh, prosthesis, so it was just a prototype. And there was no publication afterwards, except that it was taken, taken out of the patient. The game changer in shoulder arthroplasty was invented by the godfather of shoulder surgery, Dr. Charles Nier, who invented the first implant, which was used in high numbers in, with quite good results, even in the long-term survivorship. 
So about 90% survived 15 years without a revision, even up to now in the 1990s with this publication of his group. After many years of um, implementation of the first generation of the near prosthesis, there was the first soft evolution over the years with um, modular built-in prosthesis with uh, different head sizes to uh, different shaft sizes, but no angle changes or rotation changes. The newer third generation implants could be subsumized under the keyboard uh, three-dimensional adjustability so the modularity of the humeral head was not only the, the head size, but okay. especially the head angle and the rotational component on the humeral head. So you could dial on the head, so it was more or less better adjustable to the anatomy of the patient. The Equalis was there, the, the first implant um, giving um, this idea some space and lots of patients having these kind of prestige. Another way of evolution, also by near in the 1970s was uh, the implants with a fixed center of rotation. So maybe the first uh, kind of reverse prosthesis was the Mark I with a glenoid component in 1973, but the change in the calf atropathy was invented by Paul Gramont, by the idea of Paul Gramont with a, a reverse, reverse prosthesis using a medialized center of rotation and distalized humeral um, um, shaft, mm -hmm. so the force of the deltoid fibers could be reused for a good function without rotator cuff. Another soft step of evolution was done with the short stem prosthesis, which is more or less the same on the dial component of the head with the different sizes and rotational positions, but with the short stem, so it's more or less uh, metaphysary and more a little distally uh, fixation, not the classical stem fi fixation, with quite good clinic, but concerning results about um, radial lucency lines, maybe shaft loosening in the long term. So every company is shown its own special implant, but every company with short stems shows the same problems because of stress shielding of the short stems. So looking in some reviews about the short stem anatomical shoulder replacement, we come to the conclusion that a further study is needed for long-term survivorship, but for the short term that it's not worse than having um, a stem prosthesis. So when it is working since the 1950s in the near prosthesis, why are we talking about the stem at all? It's because of some problems with the stem implant. If, if you're looking at the high variability of the prox proximal humoral anatomy in normal population, you need a lot of prosthesis variations in designs to fit it more or less properly. All the prosthesis designs could not fit it really properly. You have a retroversion between minus 60 plus 60 degrees. You've got an inclination, you've got virus, you've got, you've got a posterior translation. And um, sometimes you've got an implantation problem because of malunions. So sometimes it would be easier to have no stem. If you perform an anatomic implantation in non-anatomic fashion, this leads to a significant change in the biomechanics of the joint, which may lead to overstuffing, secondary rotator cuff dysfunction, or at least a rocking horse phenomenon on the glenoid side, which is combined with early loosening of the glenoid. Another concern with the stemmed uh, implant is stem loosening is maybe not the major problem with only 7% of all cases. But stress shielding is the main problem. It's about two thirds of the patient showing stress shielding. And it's no matter if it's cemented or uncemented, it's always the load transmission from the head to the shaft, which leads to a diminution of the cortical bone around the shaft. Another problem is a major complication like uh, humor fractures intraoperative in 1.5% of all cases or peri-implant fractures after a fall. So both is not very um, visible for the surgeon. It's not easy to 
repair the intraoperative fracture if you recognize it and it's not easier to put a plate after recognition in a fall. Maybe you need longer stems and revision stems and have to explant. So it's easier to have a short stem or no stem than having the longest uh, available piece of metal into your um, humor shaft bone. And last but not least, there is the uh, hard times in revision. So if you're doing a revision, you know these pictures, we have to cut off the complete bone in the front and peel out the implant if they are in integrated really good, just to change it into a reverse prosthesis or change the stem due to other problems. So you may produce a very comp in a very complex surgery, high complication rates like non-union of the shaft fracture, radial nerve lesion, or um, even worse, uh, not integration of the re-implanted uh, prosthesis with another, with another um, problem caused by your as a doctor. So, so the first way to face the problem of uh, changing the stem just because it's getting from an anatomic to the reverse, this is convertibility. So every company are just showing two here are uh, trying to get them on the market so you can leave the stem in the shaft and just um, change the head components so you get from an anatomic implant into a an, um, stemmed reverse implant without changing the whole stem which was the first step to save some bone and some of the patients from harder complications. Another option for saving bone for later revision is saving lots of bone without using a stem. So um, Dr. Copeland came on the idea of having a resurfacing with bone saving for later operations, which did work quite good in his patients. So in his own series, there were mainly good patients. And, but there are some facing the resurfacing procedure. It is not as simple as it is described, or it seems to be, it is very hard to implant a glenoid component if you're leaving the head on. So traction is needed, which may lead to a nerve traction injury. There is a problem with the sizing of the head and the correct implantation, the anatomic positioning, which is quite hard to achieve. And it's a big number of implant loosening for a long-term follow-up and it's so only, only, always a small field of indication. It's not for mild unions, it's not for humor head necrosis, it's just for homoastrosis. So you know the, the survivorships of different uh, kinds of indications and different complications. So the main problem with the um, Copeland prosthesis is that you have um, lower, uh, higher revision rates due to a mostly hemi shoulder arthroplasty performed. So it's 22% at 10 years follow up. Although, although the, the whole group of, of Levy and uh, Copeland show really good results in a primary uh, multicenter retros retrospective study, they have shown some bigger problems. But in their own group, they have got more or less in 10 years, just about 2% of uh, loosening. Depends on if it's a total shoulder or it's a hemiatroplasty. So for conclusion, for isolated primary osteoarthritis, the Copeland prosthesis showed clinically good, but poor radiological outcomes at the midterm follow-up. And if you cut it out, you see the high loosening rates because of high stress shielding rates below the cup. So there is no good fixation after all if the stem is not healed in. And there is just minimal bone to the stem and, and there is kind of humor head bone necrosis below the humor head. So if it's not the first way to use a stemmed but modulary uh, prosthesis, you, when you don't want to make a resurfacing, there has to be a third way. The third way is uh, saving bone through a stemless implant, which is, was invented by Biomed with a test in 2004. This was the first stemless implant, which was um, implanted anatomically with a Corolla. Then 2007, the eclipse by Artrex followed. 
with quite good uh, clinical results. And in 2050, right, Ortonier came to FDA approval with a simplicity and um, comparing the numbers of implantation in 2012 compared to now, um, there is an increase of anatomic stainless prosthesis up to 650% compared to 2012. So what do or what might we expect in a modern implant in 2021? For me, it's a restoration of the joint mechanics. It's minimizing stress shielding and loosening of the implants. I want a stable and biological response to the, of the bone to the implant. I want an option to convert the prosthesis from anatomic to reverse without um, extracting the whole humoral component. And I want good clinical results. So what about anatomic reconstruction? We want to have a, a uh, anatomic humoral height. We want a center of rotation, which, which is like the anatomical version before the operation. We want an anatomical neck shaft angle. We want lateral humoral offset without overstuffing. And we want to respect the cuff insertion due to, due to the highest head. So Kedu showed us in 2050 that we can restore the center of rotation, the humoral head height, and the uh, neck shaft angle with a stemless implant in a very good fashion, but we are not able to uh, address the lateral humoral offset as we like it. It's about 20% with overstuffing, if you define overstuffing with a lateral humoral offset of more than five millimeters. This was a retrospective uh, X-ray study compared with the preoperative X-rays in 72. So, more or less, we can restore the joint mechanics, but have the problem with the host. The next point on the list is a minimum stress shielding and loosening. So how can we get this stress shielding in an adaptive process due to changes of load transmission to bone? Uh, so without stem, this seems to be even lower. And so the stemless prosthesis with a less cortical bone and trabecular load uh, produces less stress shielding compared to the standard or the short stem prosthesis. So here you can see the difference in the biomechanic between stem, short stem and stemless. So at the first, it's the radiological study we showed, we already talked about. Then we got this in vitro study from um, Fabry and the study from George Athwell and co-workers about the proximal humoral bone stresses between the stemless, short stem and uh, stem prosthesis. So the stemless prosthesis um, is the best for um, stress sheep. Commander and co-workers showed in their biomechanical stu study of bone adaptation, impact of stemless shoulder implants, a computer model um, showing that the implant in the upper right, the C model is being the best for osteointegration um, and less resorption of the bone and the eclipses the in the upper left as the worst implant for this biomechanical study. Um, the osteointegration in human is shown in three months in 100% in X-ray and SPECT CT scan uh, in another implant checked here as long as there is no load transfer to the cortical bone, especially to the cortical bone in the bicipital groove. So we can uh, make a mark at the stability and the biological response for the stemless prosthesis on our wish list. So the next one is the option to conversion, convertible systems. Right now in Germany, there's a market for only one. This is the Lima implant in the lower part of the picture. And the upper part of the picture is the Medacta, which is just getting the CE mark right now and hopefully in two years, this will be on the market as a, a competitor. And we've got the test system, which is on the market by Simo, but it's not in very high numbers used in Germany. So uh, right now, the Lima is the only real um, competitor for stemless convertible implants. So why do I want a convertible stemless anatomic prosthesis? Because it's yeah kind of easy to put in a stemless prosthesis in this kind of shaft uh, or failed fractures or fractures equally. 
but it's hard to make a revision into re into a reverse stem prosthesis as well as it would have been hard to put in a stemmed anatomic prosthesis. So you're just postponing the problem with the shaft. You, you're not solving the shaft problem if you're putting in a, a stemless anatomic prosthesis without the option of ch to change to a convertible reverse prosthesis. So this is why I decided to take these implants in my future. This is what happens if you try to put in an uh, anatomical prosthesis and have to revise it due to rotator cuff failure, and secondary rotator cuff failure after 10 years. You could even put in a stemless reverse implant without, if, if you can take out the stemless core of the first implant without much bone loss, as long as there is a cortical ring and some rest of bone is can healing. But this is just a case report done by myself. That's not the way to do it every time. So maybe you should be, it should be able to put in a stem if you have to change the complete implant. So the option to convert is for sure a good idea. So now we come to talk about the clinical results and the real benefits for the patients. The most papers are published for the Eclipse prosthesis. The first one was from my group in these times Stuttgart, showing 100 patients with quite good results for two years. There's another two years follow-up from a multicentric German group for the Eclipse with, with Peter Habermeyer in the group. There's an Austrian group with five years follow-up with a good clinical and radiological evaluation. And there's a nine years follow-up from the group on about around Peter Habermeyer and co-workers for nine years, and another seven years follow-up study in production um, about the eclipse from the group in Stuttgart. So how are the competitors performing? They are also doing quite good. The simplicity with the two years follow up with quite similar results to the Eclipse. Also, the tests from Simo Biomed is having the same long term follow ups and good survivorship rates of 85% in 49 months. So, after all, this should be quite good. So, what is the current state? In 2016, George Edwell published a uh, a work about um, arthroplasty in stemless shoulder arthroplasty and results in designs. And there's what he mentioned there's only one prosthesis in the American market that's the Simplicity, who has FDA approval. Everyone else don't, doesn't have an approval for FDA, but at least there is a two year follow up for the Eclipse, the tests, mm. and the Simplicity. So for the very clean uh, medical um, science, you need a randomized control study. Are there some out there? Yes, there are some stemless versus stem prosthesis uh, studies. There's one from Peter Habermeyer um, talking about the stemless or the stem prosthesis in anatomical fashion, showing no difference. There's two other groups, about, uh, Sprans, and there's another group of, uh, from France showing that there is no difference in stemless versus stem. So even the stemless are performing at least as good as stem, maybe better than stem prosthesis. There's no significant difference. Looking at the reverse prosthesis, there are only uh, two studies using the test implant from Philip Moroder and Balash um, showing that for the stemless prosthesis compared to the stem prosthesis, so there is no need to use stem if you're doing it randomized controlled. So maybe we are here in the future, or are we coming? So right now we can't show a real difference, significant difference in the evidence-based medicine like a, a randomized controlled trials. So maybe every guy is using his own alternative effect. So I am proposing that the stemless is as good as the stem. The other one is telling you the stem is at least as good as the stemless prosthesis. So this is maybe alternative effects or kind of alternative effects. So we have to look at the, the next point of reality. I think the, the most real data is registry data. So you can look at the Nordic atroplasty registry. It shows good survivorship for stemmed and stemless prosthesis. They are more or less the same. It's just about uh, 0 0.5 to 0.3 um, percent uh, difference between the two different implant different implant types. 
So that's not significant. Um, the only thing is if you decide to show it, if it's the eclipse is simplicity or the seed is, um, the eclipse shows the, the worst results in long time survivorship, but it's the most implanted and prosthesis or stemless prosthesis. So maybe it's the number or the, the use of the unused guys using a, a, a much easier implant like the eclipse. That's the market leading prosthesis. If you're looking for another registry, there's more or less the same data. If you're looking for the Nordic registry for hemiatroplasty or, or total atroplasty, it shows that the stemless uh, total atroplasty is surviving quite good or even better than the rest. And if you're looking for complications, there's only one study out there showing more complications with the stemless special to periprosthetic joint infection with propionic acnes in nearly 10% of the eclipse prosthesis versus around 1% for the stem prosthesis. To be honest, the paper is not telling you why it is like this, it's just showing that it's like this. If you're thinking about it, I, I, my personal belief is that the eclipse prosthesis is uh, industry driven. So every in Germany, at least, there is a supporter from the company telling you in the OR what you have to do and in which is the next step. So it's only five steps for the complete operation. It seems quite easy and maybe the more or less not as used to shoulder artistry guys uh, trying to implant these prosthesis because it seems to be quite easy to be implanted. And the stem prosthesis is a more challenging operation, which is not every guy on the street trying to do it. But this is a special or personal um, opinion. So looking at my wish list for 2021, we can make another mark on the fifth point. We have good clinical results with the stemless prosthesis. About stemless, this is not an option. So you still need a stem implant. You need a still you need a revisable or a convertible implant. So not everything can be. So in conclusion, the stemless anatomic prosthesis is my growing gold standard. The convertibility is mandatory in my opinion. So. It's no matter if it's stemmed or stemless, you should be able to convert it into a reverse arthroplasty. So in conclusion, my own approach is that I implant within the last eight or nine years right now, 250 anatomic implants since 2012 without having a stemmed implant needed since this time. I had only four conversions from stemless anatomic to stemless reverse up to now. So I can't tell you that's a good or a very bad idea, but all the four I had to do did work. Um, I can't tell you much about the, the patient's um, selection because there is no good test before the OR to say that there is a very good bone quality. Maybe there is osteodensometry, but I don't do this in a regular base. So for me, it's just resecting the humor head and making the thumb test, although I know that it's not showing the bone which I use for the impactation because in the, for the impaction, because if I do the thumb test, if you don't know it, it's just um, putting your thumb on the resection on the metaphysis. And if there is good sponges bone, you can implant a stemless prosthesis. But if you're looking at the prosthesis I am implanting, that's the Lima SMR, you just have a uh, a drill which is resecting more or less the most parts of the sponges bone so you can press it with the finger saying it's good and then you're resecting it it won't tell you if you can use it or not but usually if the, the, the trial implant is giving you a good feeling the original is giving you a quite better feeling and I didn't have to change within operation after having a good feeling with the trial if I don't have a good feeling with a trial, I just change or switch to a stemless, uh, to a stem or short stem prosthesis in the same operation. The revisions are usually done uh, with the stem prosthesis. Only special cases can uh, re re revise with a stemless reverse. So although you can read lots of books or papers, sometimes you need your own experience and need your own failures. So now you get 
to know my own results. This is my own results. Right now we've got a paper in review for anatomic and reverse prosthesis from the Lima SMR. It's a, I don't get any money for this, but it's just a study about 56 anatomics and 56 uh, reverse implants with two to four years follow-up, at least two year follow-up. We looked at the radiolucencies in different angles and positions. We looked at the, the, the radiological results and we couldn't see uh, a loosening. We saw lots of radiolucencies, especially in two areas, maybe because of the implantation, because you see there the, the thin bone there, just after resection of the bone and implanting the original prosthesis but you can't see growing numbers after two years or four years. So the radiolucencies or uh, the radiolucent lines are more or less the very small ones with just about one billion made or grade one to two. Looking at the clinical results, both uh, prosthesis types can do a significant change to the constant Morley score. Um, from pre-op to post-op. This is something you expect from every prosthesis. So also from the reverse stemless prosthesis, it's just the same as every other prosthesis as well. And looking at the complications, we had no big complications. We had a periprosthetic fractures in both groups due to a, to a fall and rib fracture and humeral head fracture, humeral shaft fracture, which could be treated with a long stem or a even plating in the one in the other case. So it's no implant correlated problems. In the reverse prosthesis, we got one problem with the patient in the rehabilitation program. They showed uh, hard working on the prosthesis after four weeks and after eight weeks, he came the, in the, the first time for the controls with an X-ray and um, the implant was healed, but it wasn't healed as we implanted it in about 140 degrees resection or neck shaft, neck shaft angle but in a 120 degree neck shaft angle after 10 weeks without subsequent moving. So the patient was happy. It did work quite well for him. He didn't have a dislocation or pain. So we just, we just left it. So just having given you a short in insight of our results, we can discuss the atomic and the reverse results for their own, but after all, it's just um, comparable results to every other um, existing study with stemless or stemmed prosthesis in the category anatomic or reverse. So it's no matter if you implant the prosthesis with or without stem, the results are the same. So in conclusion, the Lima SMR is showing good clinical and radio radiological outcome parameters. And we need another long-term result as well as in the other groups just for showing that it's a, a good system for more than two of them. I want to finish with a, a case report. This is a 65 year old woman. She's got both on the left side in 2018, she got an anatomic prosthesis you see on the left side and she got a reverse prosthesis in 2018 in December. So six months after the first on the left side. We had some problems with the resection, so it's got a little bit of higher inlay as usual, but it worked quite well. This is the same patient uh, a half year after the last operation with a total knee arthroplasty, and this is the clinical results. This is the right shoulder, the reverse prosthesis. This is the left, the anatomic, on the right, the reverse. and. It was just hard to get at what, what you want to do, but after all, she's moving like there's nothing much left, no matter if it's anatomic or reverse. Just one, la just one last word to this. Um, I think it's much more necessary to concentrate where we get with our instruments because the glenoid is the main problem, not the stem or stemless prosthesis. But if you get like a mixed or augmented reality, like PID or maybe uh, goggles or something, I think this would be the next game changer in shoulder surgery more than it is what I talked about that it's stemless, but because I think stemless idea is self-evident. So, so thank you for your kind attention to my talk and I hope you could take some things with you and uh, I could convince you of a stemless prosthesis as it is possible. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian, for that brilliant presentation. And uh, glad to see the great work that you're doing in Germany. Uh, just a few questions. You can actually stop sharing your screen. Okay. Okay. There are some studies that have shown conflicting results with high rates of loosening and complications with stemless arthroplasty. Uh, why do you think is that? Because if you look at data from, uh, I mean, long-term studies, they all found high rates of loosening and complications with stemless arthroplasty. You mean there are studies out there showing, uh, which are showing that their stemless is more loosening than the stem prosthesis? Yes. Well, I tried to show you that it's not like this. <laughs> All the studies so I showed you. you. Why is it still not accepted among shoulder surgeons as much as a stem implant? I'm sorry, but I, I don't get the, get your question because I think the stemless prosthesis is as, as good as the stem prosthesis due to uh, loosening. There's no more loosening with the stemless prosthesis. Okay, fine, no issues. And have you revised any of your stemless processes? If it's an anatomic and I have to revise it because it's a, it's a cuff failure, then I just can take my stemless anatomic and just make it convertible in the reverse. Otherwise, I have to use a stem and put out the stemless prosthesis like the eclipse or something. You have to put it out and put in a stem prosthesis if it's possible. And as I try to show you, if it's very hard to put in an anatomic stemless prosthesis cause of a male union or a false union of the humeral shaft, it's not easier to put in a reverse shaft. So I try to keep them reverse stemless. So do you do stem processes today? I mean, is it all, all your processes are predominantly stemless? No, I think the anatomics, yes. The reverse, I do 50-50, just because I'm afraid of the age, because it's the elder people. I don't know about osteoporosis, and there's no study out there telling you which, where is the break off. So I, 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 I make because of my feeling, but the younger guys having a cuff failure or something, which I just can't address with the repair of the rotator cuff, they get the stemless and all the men. I don't take age for an indication or contraindication, it's just the elder women. So women about 80 and older, I don't put in a stemless prosthesis, but I maybe I should try because <laughs> I don't think it's a main issue. And for the anatomic use, always a stemless, is it? Yes. In most of the cases, as long as it's primary osteoarthritis. Okay. And... Uh... What are your indications? What are your common indications for doing a uh, anatomic shoulder replacement in your yes. clinical practice? Yes, the, the main patients are osteoarthritic or instability, chronic instability, and therefore there's a good bone stock, and that's why you can put it in. I've got only a few uh, humor head necrosis, but if it's just the head, the, 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 the joint part, you can saw it away, and then it's not a problem. And I, I don't have infections for for anatomic reconstruction. I wouldn't do it in an infected situation because I, I would do it as a first resection and put in some um, cement with uh, antibiotics and then in the second stage operation, a stem prosthesis. But usually the omatrotic patients, so osteoarthritis, primary osteoarthritis, instability, fracture sequelae, I usually do with um, stemless prosthesis. And uh, have you tried arthroplasty in proximal humerus fractures? Have you, I mean, is it, is arthroplasty one of your choices? Yeah, well, um, in my case, I, most of my, my patients get a osteosynthesis if they've got a fracture. If it's a bad fracture and I can't do it with a plate, I tend to do it with a reverse and then it's a stemmed reverse, but not an anatomic stem. It's just a reverse with a stem for me. Okay. Thank you so much, Christian. I think that's all the questions that we have for the session. Fantastic lecture, and I'm sure everyone has understood the concept of a stemless implant. I'm sure this is going to reach a lot of people all over the world. Thank you so much, Christian, for joining. Hope so. You're very welcome.